comprehend that part, but as we read, you're going to see, it very clearly is saying that every single person on the earth is actually going to hear and understand this angel. It's not just a symbolic thing. The angel just the angel's not up there flying in the midst of heaven making an announcement for John's benefit. It's for the people that are on the earth. You'll see it as you read. And uh, remember, one of the things I always tell you about the book of Revelation is I always say, I want you to totally blank out your mind and forget everything you've ever heard or ever thought or ever learned about Revelation. And I'm not telling you that because I'm saying it's all wrong. I'm not saying all the ideas in your head are wrong. And I'm not saying all the things you heard from other Bible teachers are wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you're going to miss things. If you read the Bible and you're kind of playing this tape recorder in your head of everything you saw in a Left Behind movie or something like that. You understand? If you've got... You know, I've, I, I, I've watched Adrian Rogers' entire series on Revelation. It's good. I disagree on a few details with him, but it's good. And I've read other books, and I've heard lots of teachings on Revelation. I've read many books on it. I've heard lots of teaching. But you know what? Um, you're going to miss things you need to know if you are playing a recording in your head of what you think it already means. You're going to miss stuff, and you're not going to notice, wait, that doesn't fit, wait, that doesn't fit, that, that doesn't, you're not going to notice. And so if we blank out our minds while we're going through this, we can go later and we can still pick up good stuff from other teachers, but let's blank out our minds so that we don't miss it, so that we're not carrying on a conversation. You know, there's that saying, it's really true, and I, I'm guilty of this all the time. We listen to respond, right, rather than listening to understand, right? And that's sad, but we do that to each other. You know, it's like somebody's like, oh, oh that's their political belief. Okay, and then now we tuned out. We're not even hearing anything else they're saying because we've been like, well, I voted for the guy I don't like, so I don't really care the rest of your opinion. Well, the problem is they might be trying to tell us something important. And I'm not saying their political opinion is right. I'm saying you might miss something important they're telling you. You're not listening. You're not trying to understand them. You're just responding you're thinking okay i'm gonna when they're done talking i'm gonna say this or this or that you know that's yeah. and and we do that in politics but we do that in religion too we do that in christianity don't we or we do it in relationships hey in marriage we do it that's the thousandth time she said that right that's the millionth time he's done that right and now we're clicking in rows but wait maybe your spouse has a really important point they're trying to make to you and you're just tuning them out you know and it goes both ways husbands and wives he always does that she always does it well, maybe the reason why he's walking out mad is because there's something that you did to make him mad. Maybe you should find out what that is, and the next time he won't walk out mad. Okay, I'm just, using, just talking both sides here. Maybe the reason she's nagging you, not giving a woman an excuse to nag, maybe the reason she's nagging you is because there's something that you did that really upset her, and you could just say, I'm sorry, and go fix it, and then she won't nag you anymore. You know? So listen to understand, not to reply. Now, that's true. I'm guilty of it. You are. We all are. But now, how about the Bible? Listen to understand, not to reply. Okay, yeah, let's see. Uh, uh -huh, yeah, I believe this and I believe that. And you're only noticing the stuff that lines up with what you already think, and you're not even noticing things. And so we need to read the Bible. The whole Bible we should read this way, but especially when we're reading Revelation, because there's so many like fixed ways of saying, here's what's going to happen. Let's not miss anything. Let's not miss anything. So I have to start with um, verse 1 and talk about that, and then we'll move on. We won't get to that angel until verse 6, so let's start with verse 1. Uh, so he says in uh, verse 1, uh, okay, so I realize now I, I just got to catch you up because we it was a month ago. So remember, chapter 13 is all about the beast, right? Which is, the Bible says, it's uh, the number of a man that is, it's a man, okay? Uh, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, he's got right different places in the Bible, um, and, uh, and he, and, and the reason that I know, by the way, the reason that I, some people have said, well, maybe the Antichrist symbolizes not, not a person, but something else, like a country or a nation or something. Well, the interesting thing, uh, or an empire, but the interesting thing about the beast is at, at the battle of Armageddon, when Jesus comes back, the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire and they're tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, an empire can't be cast in the lake of fire, Right? A movement, a group of that can't be cast. It, it has to be a person. He's at the Battle of Armageddon, and then he's captured and cast into the lake of fire. And he's tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, how do I know that? Well, how do I know that it's a person? Well, then because the devil is cast in the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are. The devil is a spirit being, an individual, and he gets cast in the same lake of fire. And then 
there's a great right throne, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. The lake of a fire is a place for individuals that, that they go for eternity if their name's not in the Lamb's book of life. And so because it's a place for real beings to go, we know that the beast and the false prophet are humans. They're, they're people. They're, they're beings, okay? I know that there's a, a spirit that comes out of the bottomless pit that inhabits, that basically indwells the Antichrist, okay? He could just be the devil or it could be another spirit um, that indwells the Antichrist. Um, but still, he is a person, okay? And he's called he in the Bible, all right? Like, there are many passages where he's referred to in, as, a, as a masculine person. So, you know, it's going to be a man. The Antichrist is going to be a man, okay? So, uh, so in chapter 13, there's all this detail given about the Antichrist and, and what he's going to do. He's going to reign for 42 months, right? So that's uh, starting in the middle of that seven-year period. So there's a seven weeks, uh, seven weeks, which are, we know that they are, um, they're, sorry, there is a one week, and we know that that represents seven years because uh, the numbers in Daniel are given for 483 years. Uh, it's uh, 69 weeks, and he says it's 69 weeks from the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince is 69 weeks. And so you add it all up, 69 weeks, and you, you do it into Jewish years, and it goes directly to the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. So because we already have an example that the weeks actually represent weeks of years, in the same way, the final, it says in the midst of the week, he'll take away the daily sacrifice, right? He'll make a covenant with them for one week. That, that's the, it, the, 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 the Jewish people. And in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifice to cease. The Bible says he's going to go into the temple, and he's going to take a seat in the temple, and he's going to say that he's God, and everybody's supposed to worship him. That's all. We've already studied that, right? Okay. So Revelation 13 is all about... The mark of the beast, okay, so they're going to put up a, um, a um, um, it, the mark of the beast is a literal mark. Um, it is, uh, we talked about that last time, it, it, the word for mark is charagma, the Greek word, like a character, and it, but it literally means a carving or a stamp or an imprinting, okay, so it is a visible mark that people will have, and they'll take it as a, they're proud that they are worshiping the Antichrist, they already know at this stage because they've seen us go up in the rapture and they said, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb and of him that sit on the throne. Every human on the earth knows that God is real, Jesus is real. They know it's all true. That's not going to make them follow Jesus any more than your children one day wake up and go, oh, I always thought my parents didn't exist, but now I know that they're, they're real, so I guess I'll obey them now. That's not how it works. <laughs> okay? Adam and Eve in the garden, they weren't like, oh, you mean God's real? Oh, if we'd known we wouldn't have eaten the fruit. No. <laughs> they knew God was real. Uh, they wanted to disobey, right? Uh, nobody disobeys because they don't believe the person exists. They disobey because they want to do what they want to do. All disobedience is like that. So, in fact, God is very gentle with people who sin out of ignorance. In the Bible, it's real sin always has to do with you know the wrong thing and you do it anyway. Him that knoweth do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay, so it's our whole idea that all oh, people are innocent, don't know any better. That's just nonsense. Okay, so in the time we're very young, we all have a conscience, we know right and wrong. We all, the Bible says everybody in the world knows that there's a God, even now, because of nature. Um, whether they admit it or not, everyone already knows their God. But then there's going to come a day when they're actually going to see Jesus. When at the rapture, like I said, the, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. They're going to see him. Uh, and we went all over that. We proved that. I'm not going to do that again. Um, so what is going to happen then? They are going to say, let's follow the Antichrist because he lets, tells us what we want to hear. And he offers us another religion that doesn't involve obeying God. He is in rebellion against God. So everybody is following the Antichrist because they don't want to follow Jesus Christ. That's what's going on. And so um, the Jewish people, of course, they're like, oh, we get to build a temple. That's wonderful. They think it's all great until he says, you worship me. And at that point, a whole bunch of Jews are going to say no. We talked about that. They're going to flee into the wilderness, right? So they're going to be, they're going to be protected um, while he's persecuting them for not, for not worshiping him. Um, and there's going to be the, the witnesses, the two witnesses that prophesy. We talked about all that. So just catching up, in chapter 13, it's talking about the mark of the beast. And the, the beast, the Antichrist, ruling the world. And so then what happens is, what are they doing? They're getting uh, the name. The Bible never actually says it's going to be a number on your forehead. It actually says it's going to be a mark. It says that the number is actually a clue about his name. It calls it the number of his name. So we get this idea of six, 
166 on your forehead. Uh, the number is 666, as I told you before. It's not three sixes. It's not 6-6-6. Six dash six dash six. It's actually 666, okay, which is different, right? If I have um, three piles of apples here, and there's six in this pile, and there's six in this pile, and there's six in that pile, how many apples is that? 18. 18. But if I have a pile of 666 apples, is that a different number? Yeah. It is. That might help you. The number is not 666. It is 666. That's the number. And it's a clue that relates to his name. It says the number of his name. I'm not telling you I know what it is, but I'm just telling you uh, that I don't want, you know, we can speculate. I have speculations. We can speculate all night. Um, it's kind of fun to speculate sometimes, but I'm not going to tell you from the pulpit, here's what it is, because I don't know what it is. But I do know it's a clue. People at the time will be able to figure out, okay, yeah, he's the Antichrist, and they'll be able to connect it up, okay, when it happens. So, um, but the people who get the mark, this is so important. They're not going to be like, oh, I can't buy and sell. Oh, no. Okay, I guess I better get a mark. And then they're like, oh, no, I got the mark, and now I'm going to go to hell. That's not how it's going to work at all. That's how I thought it was when I was a kid. It's not going to work at all. The Bible says that they worship him, and then they get the mark. And everywhere it mentions the mark, it talks about worshiping him. These are people who are freely choosing to worship the Antichrist so they don't have to worship and obey Jesus Christ. It's a deliberate choice, a deliberate choice that they make to reject Jesus Christ and worship the Antichrist. And that's a choice that people make today to follow the devil and not Jesus Christ. That's a choice they make. People are already making that choice, but it's just going to be much more obvious in, this, in that time because people will have seen Jesus and know that he's real and choose it anyway. It'll be much more clear, much more blatant. But it will still be no different than really everybody's hearts today is our hearts are wicked and we want to do what we want to do. And so we reject God and follow the way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways are the ways of death. So <clears throat> that is what um, is, is happening there. Now the reason I'm saying that is because of this next verse. There's another mark. <coughs> there's another mark. Not just me, Mark, another mark. But there's another mark. Okay, it says uh, in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 1, that I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. So in your notes, it's the word Zion. Okay, now we know this is Mount Zion, right? So why does it say Zion? Well, this is something I've told you many times about the King James Bible. The New Testament is written in Greek, not in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, that it's Zion, and that actually comes from a Hebrew letter that's called Tzade. It's like a T-S, Tzion. But in Greek, there is no letter, Tzion. And so in Greek, they didn't have the T-S sound, so they just wrote an S. So because John is writing in Greek, he doesn't write Tzion. He wrote, writes in Greek, Tzion, because they don't have the letter. It's a, you'll notice like, like Elijah is called Elias, right? Why is there an S on the end? Because in Greek, if they called him Eliah, or El, in, in Greek, Eliahu is not a name, but in Greek, but if they said Eliah, that would actually be a girl's name in Greek. In, in Hebrew, it's a boy's name, but in Greek it would be a girl's name. So they put Elias, and they put an S on the end. Because in Greek, if you put an S on the end of a name, it becomes masculine, okay? So that's why they call him Elias. And on and on we could go. That's why Jesus, you know, Jesus' real name was Joshua, but Joshua is a feminine-sounding name in Greek, so in order to make it masculine, they did Jesus. In the Old Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, Joshua is called Jesus. And in the New Testament, Jesus is called Jesus, and his real name was Joshua. That was, some people say Yeshua, that's not quite accurate. It was actually Yehoshua. So, it's okay, that's, that's a technicality. But a lamp stood on Mount Zion. I'm telling you, that's Mount Zion, but in Greek, they didn't have that T-S sound, so they just wrote an S. Lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 140 and 4,000. So the word there is 140 and 4,000. Having his father's name written in their foreheads. So, there's another mark. But now, think about it. I can see our time's up, so I have to wrap up here. Think about it. How is the lamb on Mount Zion. Where is Mount Zion? Mount Zion is actually the hill that um, Jerusalem is built on. 
In the Bible talks about Mount Zion, Mount Zion. It's the hill of Jerusalem. Right now, what's go in, in this context, what's going on in Jerusalem? I mean, there's a temple, the Antichrist is reigning, and he's persecuting the Jews, and he's making everybody take the mark. Jesus is not hanging out in Jerusalem, right? With the 144,000. So Mount Zion, the heaven is the new Jerusalem. So he's having a vision, and Jesus, the Lamb, he's in heaven. He's calling heaven Mount Zion, because heaven is also, there's a heavenly Jerusalem, right? The Bible says there's an earthly Jerusalem, there's a heavenly Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem, remember we talked about how it's a picture of heavenly things? An example of heavenly things, right? Talk about that on Thursday nights. So, do you know the earthly Jerusalem, where God's people dwelled in Old Testament times? That was actually a picture of heaven. And that's why someday there's going to be a new Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem is going to come down to earth and be on the earth. It's going to be a little bit bigger than the earthly Jerusalem. <laughs> I've, you can walk around like the earthly Jerusalem in like about an hour, hour and a half. <laughs> this one is going to be 1,500 miles long and wide and tall. So it's going to be a little bit bigger. But <laughs> anyway, um, so, so when he says, I saw the lamb on Mount Zion, I'm, an, I'm telling you this because the commentary I read before I started uh, 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 you know, I like to read other people's ideas. I, I was I was confused. In, when, I, I wonder what he's going to say about this. And he said, "Oh, that's like somehow a, a, a picture view. It's like stopping out of chronological order and and, and telling you that that he's going to be there with the 144,000 in Jerusalem. It's like, no, like this is in chronology. This happens, then that happens, and that happens. So he's looking and he's seeing. This is so important. This is so key to understanding the Book of Revelation." He's having a vision, and he's seeing right after the mark of the beast is given. He's seeing Jesus, right, the Lamb, on Mount Zion, Jesus in heaven, listen, with the 144,000. Oh, this will change your whole view of Revelation. The Antichrist rules. He gives everybody a mark. He says, you all have to worship me. And boom, the next thing you know, 144,000 that were on the earth. Right? In chapter 7? Mm -hmm. They're in heaven. I wonder how they got to heaven. They refused to take the mark. And they got killed. That's why they're all in heaven. I mean, how else could they get there? Is it going to be a second rapture, a third rapture? How many raptures are going to be, right? They all got killed. The 144,000, they did their job. In my view, it's about three and a half years or so. They were preaching the gospel. And that's how lots of people got saved before then. And that's how come a whole bunch of people are going to refuse to take the mark. Because 144,000, right? you got the two witnesses as well. We're doing great signs and wonders and miracles. And you got the 144,000 all over the world. And they're telling people, and they're preaching the gospel, and people are going to refuse to take the mark. You see, God is merciful, and he gives people chance after chance after chance to repent. Amen. And so just because we go, boom, 144,000 people get saved right after the rapture. They're all 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. Okay, and they get saved, and they, uh, they start preaching. And then what happens is, in the, um, right around that time, I, we can't say exactly, but right around the time that the beast, he said, everybody in the world has to worship me, and here's, a, and, if, and, and here's a mark that you can wear on your forehead or your hand if you worship me. And you can't to punish people for not worshiping him. Here's, you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark, right? That's how you prove that you worshiped him is by getting the mark. I mean, there's probably people worship him. They can worship him without getting the mark, but you have to prove it, show your loyalty, you know? Um, so <laughs> we, we've never had governments do that, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Travel with evidence of what you've done, right? So um, you have proof. It's like your little passport, right, is the mark, okay? So, um, so what happens is um, they are in heaven because they refuse to take the mark. But look what it says. Having his father's name written in their foreheads. Huh. Now, the Bible doesn't say they're going to get a visible, visible mark. They don't need one. Why? Because they don't have to buy and sell with it. They don't have any reason why they need a visible mark. But John looks up in heaven and he sees the lamb and the 144,000. And they've all got a mark on their forehead. But it's the father's name. Because what is a mark? It's like ownership. It's worship, but it's also ownership, right? And so listen, the people who refuse to worship the beast, they've got a mark too, right? Their mark is they belong to God. It's like a seal. God, they belong to God. They refuse to worship the beast. They worship God. They've got a mark on their forehead too. And they're in heaven. How did they get there? They were killed because they wouldn't take the mark. 
Okay, well now it must be all dark and, and, and done and finished now. Not yet. A whole bunch more people are going to be saved in chapter 14. A whole bunch. We can't talk about it today. We're out of time, but it's coming. Um, so they have the Father's name in their forehead. During this time, the Antichrist is reigning on the earth. Therefore, Mount Zion refers to heaven. The 144,000 are in heaven because they've been killed by the Antichrist. They have the Father's name in their foreheads because they worship God, not the beast. Now remember, oh, pastor, spinning theories. I mean, he sees 144,000 in heaven. That must mean he was, they were killed because they wouldn't take the mark. Well, I don't know if the plain sense makes good sense. <laughs> Seek no other sense, lest it be nonsense. How else did they get to heaven, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, 2 to 5 says this. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. I wonder what those people are doing. No, harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And this is amazing. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Um... So in your notes, it's the word not. Um, and these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. The next word is the word first fruits. So it's the word not and first fruits. Now, they have this special song, and they're the only ones that can sing it. And they are, I mean, think about it, they're the first fruits. What does it mean they were the first fruits? Well, so first of all, because it says they have not had relationships with women, we know that the 144,000 are men. Okay? That doesn't mean there aren't going to be women saved in the time of the uh, revelation. There will be lots of women saved then. But the, these specific 144,000 are men. Okay? Um, that's how we know, because it says they were not defiled women. Uh, why aren't they married? Why are they single? Well, remember the Apostle Paul said, It is good for the present distress for everyone to be as I am. Because it's such a time of persecution, Jesus said, woe to, be the, woe to those who are with child in those days. Right? He, said, he talked about the difficulty of the last days. And so I would just say that they had a very difficult job to do, and ultimately they're all going to get martyred. right? So they need 144,000 widows. right? So they were all single because they were busy sharing the gospel and serving God. Um, and it says they're the first fruits. So because it says they have not had a relationship with women, we know that the 144,000 are men. And they are called the first fruits unto God because they were the first to be saved after the rapture. That's what I believe. So first fruits is the idea of the beginning of something, right? The first fruits, like the feast of the first fruits, you bring it to the temple. The Bible says Jesus is first fruits from the dead. The Bible says that uh, the Jewish people were the first fruits to be saved, like after Pentecost, right? It was a bunch of Jewish people that were saved. They were first fruits. There's several mentions of first fruits um, as, as being people who were saved in the New Testament, several mentions. Um, and so uh, I believe that these, these 144,000 are called the first fruits because they were the first group of people to be saved after the rapture. But if there's first fruits, are there other fruits coming after? Yes. So I've got to say 100, 144,000, that's a small number compared to the number of people who are going to be saved in the book of Revelation. And this is the thing that completely blew my mind when I first started really studying Revelation a couple years ago, and that was when I was like, man, I am going to teach from Revelation, is I realized it just a light bulb went on. I'm reading these passages where all these people are appearing in heaven. All these huge numbers of people appearing in heaven. And a light bulb went on, I want the whole reason why God is doing all this judgment on the earth, including allowing the Antichrist and everything to happen, and all the slaughter and the bloodshed and the judgment, is so that more people will go to heaven. Amen. That's why. The Bible says when he killed them, then they sought him. <laughs> it's a real thing that judgments cause people to seek God. And so God knew that the best way to get the maximum number of people in heaven is to lay out this last days. And here's the iron, ir irony. The devil thinks he's going to get more people in hell by inspiring the Antichrist to force everybody to worship him. There's going to be more people in heaven because of that. Because a lot of people are going to wake up when they are being forced to worship the Antichrist. And they're going to say, no. And part of the reason is because there's going to be an angel flying in the midst of heaven telling everybody to worship God and not the Antichrist. And warning them that they will go to the lake of fire if they worship the Antichrist. And large numbers of people are going to turn to Christ and end up in heaven because of that. It's so hard for us to picture. You look at the world today. 
You look at our country today, and doesn't it get depressing and discouraging? Not just government, but think of how many people you share the gospel with who aren't interested. Think of how small many churches are, right? Think of how, how many Christians are like, hey, I'm giving up on God and church, and they're not even going to church, and I'm reading the Bible. It gets depressing, doesn't it? It gets discouraging. I get discouraged. I know you do too. Hey, that's how we get encouraged. There's a time coming when large numbers of people are going to be saved. And they're going to go straight to heaven. I mean, they're going to die, but they're going to go straight to heaven. And there's going to be a big party there. And look at these first fruits. They're singing a special song, and they're the only ones that are allowed to sing that song. They're like the heroes. They're welcome to heaven as soon as this 144,000 martyrs. Because here is what the Antichrist thinks. Oh, well, these 144,000 won't worship me. Oh, well, let's kill them all. That's easy. Line them all up. Slaughter them all. Right? And now they're in heaven, and they enter heaven with this huge fanfare and cheering. They're the heroes because they gave their lives, and they would. They, they were faithful. They did the job God gave them to do. Like the apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. And their example, they get to heaven. And huge number, and they get they have a special song. They're standing there, they're with the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. They're like the heroes of heaven, these 144,000. And they have a special song that they can sing. And then on earth, large numbers of people are going to be saved after that angel goes flying in the midst of heaven. It's an amazing thing to consider. And that's why the book of Revelation is so encouraging, and that's why we need to read it. Because so we don't go, oh, everything's just dark and just getting worse, and nothing good's going to happen. No. Actually, the darker the night, the brighter the light. And God has a plan. And right now the devil is like, oh, I'm, I'm winning, I'm winning. <laughs> you're winning? No, you're not. Yeah. You're losing. And yes, God is going to give people free will. But he has a plan to reach the maximum number of people. This is a saying that I've gotten in trouble online for saying because I have a lot of Calvinist friends. Hi, Calvinist friends. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, it is absolutely true. I believe my whole heart is taught throughout the Bible. God has a plan for all of history so that the maximum number of people will be saved without violating their free will. I don't think I'm saying it quite right. Just God, in his perfect foreknowledge, planned every detail of history so that the maximum number of people would end up in heaven without violating their free will. Amen. God is that big and that smart. He can do that. So, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this encouraging message from your word. Father, I pray that we would trust in you and keep being faithful. We have our own race to run. Plus to race our run, run our race with patience, like the Bible says, looking unto Jesus and uh, to uh, for the joy that is set before us, endure the cross, just like Jesus did. In Jesus' name, amen.